Tonight we have the honor to hear Yoram Ettinger. Yoram Ettinger is an Israeli researcher, diplomat, writer, lecturer, and consultant to Israeli and U.S. legislators and their staffers. He's an expert on U.S.-Israel relations, Middle East affairs, and Jewish-Arab demography. Yoram Ettinger is a co-founder of the America-Israel Demographic Research Group, which has documented a two million gap in the number of Arabs in Judea and Samaria and Gaza. Yoram Ettinger serves as Israel's Consul General in Texas and subsequently headed Israel's government press office. Then he worked at the Israeli Embassy in the United States as the diplomat responsible for relations with the US Congress. He held the rank of ambassador. According to Dennis Ross and Michael Mikofsky, it is Ettinger who is the intellectual and polit political spear spearhead of the efforts to counter the demographic threat narrative. The Jewish state is not facing a potential Arab demographic time bomb. According to the Middle East Journal, Ettinger's effort had a major impact on the debate over the implications of demography for the peace process. And according to Professor Itamar Rabinovich, who was Israel's chief negotiator with Syria, Ettinger had a role in preventing an Israeli withdrawal from the Golan Heights. And for us, Yoram Ettinger is a friend and a full partner in the sovereignty movement Yoram has been there since day one, promoting Israeli sovereignty. Uh, uh, Yehudit and I remember how we called him and we constantly call Yoram to ask for his advice. Yoram has the most incredible website called the Ettinger Report. Any information that you want about any question on all the topics that are important, you can find on Yoram's website and his, in, his, in his YouTube videos. Yoram is always there with us, Women in Green and the Sovereignty Movement in Shdema, in Ozvega on, uh, uh, um, everywhere, talking with the Sovereignty Youth. Yoram's knowledge and optimism is a source of great strength. It is our honor, Judith Katzover and me and the Sovereignty Movement and the Ozvega on Lecture Group to uh, uh, give the microphone over now to Yoram. Bevakasha, wait a second. Everybody, please make sure your microphone is closed. Yigal, tashtik et kulanu, veyoram, tiftach, bevakasha, open your microphone, and we will ask questions in 45 minutes. Thank you very much for the <coughs> generous, uh, overly generous uh, introduction. Uh, in, my, in my mind, uh, in order to understand the significance of the November 2020 uh, implications uh, for U.S.-Israel relations, as well as its very significant uh, milestone in U.S. Uh, history, uh, one has to be familiar with the recent uh, demographic transformation uh, which has uh, characterized the U.S.A. In fact, uh, demographic transformation of the last uh, 40, 50 years, which has been accelerated uh, during the last uh, 10, 15 years, and I assume will be further accelerated uh, if indeed uh, Biden uh, assumes the presidency. Uh, that type of uh, uh, very, very critical milestone in America's history uh, changing, changing the demography of the U.S. in a very dramatic uh, manner uh, has been uh, joined or intensified by the cultural uh, war, cultural battle, which has taken place in the U.S., uh, mostly between the major urban centers in the US, uh, New York, Los Angeles, Miami, Baltimore, uh, Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, Chicago, uh, possibly Houston and Dallas on the one hand, and then the small town rural uh, flyover America, uh, which uh, constitute both of them two very, very different cultures, very distinct uh, cultures. And last election was basically a battle between those two uh, cultures, which also impacts very directly uh, U.S.-Israel relations. Uh, we have seen a battle between 
the major urban centers and rural and small town America, which means in effect a battle between cosmopolitan, multilateral universalist America of the big cities and the America of small towns and flyover America, rural America, which firmly believes in the independence of the unilateral US national security action. This is a battle between big government represented by the big cities and civil liberties and limited governor, government represented by a small town and rural uh, America. This is also a battle between those who believe in uh, cancel culture, which has afflicted the US in recent months, in recent uh, years. Uh, also cancel culture coupled with revisionist uh, history uh, on the one hand, and America of rural America, small town flyover America, which believes in America's history as it has been since the early pilgrims in uh, the early 17th century until uh, today. What's the connection to Israel? Very direct uh, connection because in fact, November of 1620, uh, 400 years ago, uh, the 120 passengers of the Mayflower landed in uh, Plymouth Rock in the, the New World. And the passengers of the Mayflower considered themselves to be the people of the modern day covenant, the modern day chosen people. They believed that they left Britain, modern day Egypt, that they arrived at modern day Canaan, modern day promised land, and therefore the well over 1000 uh, towns, cities, uh, rivers, deserts, mountains, national parks, uh, bearing biblical uh, names. Uh, we have in Israel, one Jerusalem and one Shiloh. In the US, you have 18. Uh, Jerusalem's and over 80, over 80 uh, Shilohs. And certainly uh, when it comes to uh, cancel uh, culture, it means you distance yourself from the early pilgrims and the founding fathers. The early pilgrims and the founding uh, fathers based much of their uh, civic uh, institutions uh, on the uh, Old Testament, mostly on uh, the legacy of Moses, the legacy of uh, Exodus. And the more you distance yourself from that uh, legacy, the more you distance yourself from the special attitude towards the Jewish state, which still characterizes most Americans, but uh, the number is getting smaller and smaller uh, by the day in recent, uh, in recent years. It's, it also means you distance yourself from patriotism, you distance yourself from the various statues of American historical uh, heroes, and certainly you don't have the same attitude towards the American flag, towards the American anthem, or towards In God We Trust, which has been very fundamental in the American uh, culture, all of which, all of which underlines the very special attitude towards uh, Israel. And that brings me back to the November 2020 election, which featured, which featured in my mind, uh, growing strength to the cancel culture uh, uh, element in America, uh, which, could be, which could be at the expense of the special attitude towards, uh, towards Israel. We're talking about uh, the US following uh, the election uh, and as it is now, as it is now barring very uh, dramatic, uh, ultra dramatic uh, 
developments in the courts of the USA, we are going to have uh, Biden as the next president of the USA, and certainly around him, especially in the House of Representatives, we are going to see uh, growing uh, representation of what is called the progressive uh, Democrats. Uh, progressive is a very misleading uh, term. This is the radical wing of the Democratic uh, Party, which not only do they believe in the cancel culture and revisionist uh, history, but they also are very, very top heavy on criticizing uh, the Jewish uh, state while embracing uh, the Palestinians and other radical elements in the Middle East, including, by the way, including the Ayatollahs of Iran and Hamas in uh, Gaza, obviously the Palestinian uh, Authority. When one talks about uh, the growing representation in the, uh, by the progressive Democrats in the House of Representatives, this could have an impact, an impact, a very substantial impact, for instance, on the most powerful uh, committee in the House, which is the Appropriations uh, Committee. Uh, we, may, we may have uh, chairmen or probably chairwomen of the Appropriations Subcommittee on Foreign Operations and Defense. Uh, both committees are most crucial to US-Israel strategic cooperation to what is erroneously called also foreign aid to uh, Israel. And the two leading candidates for the chairmanship are two of the most critical uh, members, critical of uh, Israel, very antagonistic towards, uh, towards Israel. Until election, uh, there were two very powerful chairman in the House, one of the Appropriations Committee and one of the uh, Foreign Affairs Committee, uh, Nita Lowy of the Appropriations and Elliot Engel of uh, the Foreign Affairs. And uh, Elliot Engel was defeated in the Democratic primary by a progressive uh, Democrat, Nita Lowy. I believe she's 83 year old. She decided to uh, retire. Uh, there's no doubt in my mind that anyone who is going to replace her will not come even near to her very, very uh, positive attitude towards enhanced US-Israel uh, cooperation. And I mentioned uh, that element uh, house before uh, going into the uh, presidency because under the American political uh, system, the legislature is co-equal and co-determining. It's not under the uh, executive as it is in Israel. It is co-equal uh, and co-determining and not only in domestic, but also in external national security and foreign relations uh, issues. In fact, if we go back to 1948 until uh, today, uh, the legislature has always, but always been very, very supportive of the Jewish state. While every president until Trump pressured Israel, some pressured brutally, some punished Israel, some suspended defense accords with Israel, uh, shipment of uh, combat aircrafts to Israel, Congress has always been supportive of presidents. And in fact, during the Bush senior, Bush Baker uh, administration, uh, which was very, very hostile, and that's an understatement towards the Shamir government uh, that uh, time. And during that, those years, it was Congress, both House and Senate, which expanded unprecedentedly the strategic and commercial cooperation between the US and Israel in defiance of presidential and secretary of state opposition 
and, uh, and uh, pressure. And they did that due to their power, which again goes back to the early pilgrims and the founding fathers who established the American system. And it was established to a large extent, not full extent, but to a large extent based on the legacy of uh, Moses, the civic covenant erected by Moses during the 40 years in the desert, the different uh, level of governments, Moses, uh, Aaron, the presidents of the tribes, which one could equal to governors of states uh, today, the leaders of the thousands, the leader of the hundreds, the leaders of the, uh, of the uh, tens. And that was called the federalist system because federalist is the derivative of the Latin word fedus. And fedus is the Latin word for the covenant the covenant between God and Abraham and God, Isaac and Jacob and uh, Moses. And again, the early pilgrims, the founding fathers considered it suitable to refer to their own covenant in the biblical sense, namely the federalist system, the system of the, uh, of the covenant. Uh, moving on now to the... Uh, president's uh, policy towards uh, Israel. Uh, Israel enjoyed four very, very exceptional years under President uh, Trump. Exceptional because as I mentioned before, he was the first and so far only uh, president who has not pressured uh, Israel. And that also was accompanied by series of very, very historical initiatives uh, uh, led, by, led by the president and most uh, re more recently, Secretary uh, Pompeo, who by the way, one, was one of the leaders of the pro-Israel uh, group in the House of Representatives when he was a congressman, a member of the House, uh, from the state of uh, Kansas. We're talking about a shift uh, of uh, policy, which uh, will be uh, implemented, no doubt in my mind, should uh, Biden assume the presidency on January uh, 20th. And the most significant uh, element is not directly related to Israel, but has an indirect uh, paramount impact on Israel. And that's the attitude towards defense uh, budget. The Obama-Biden administration cut the defense budget in a very substantial manner during its eight uh, years. The Trump administration increased the defense budget in a very substantial manner during the recent for uh, years. Defense budget reflects upon posture of deterrence or power of deterrence. Uh, the US with a reduced defense budget also has lesser, lower posture of uh, deterrence. A US which expands its defense budget exerts much more effective posture of deterrence enhanced U.S. posture of deterrence is welcomed by all U.S. allies. Reduced U.S. posture of deterrence is cheered by every single rogue regime in the Middle East and uh, beyond by every uh, adversary and enemy of the U.S. as well as of, uh, of uh, Israel. Uh, we're talking about uh, an expected, an expected uh, uh, transformation uh, of attitude towards the Ayatollahs of uh, Iran. Uh, the only way to assess what will be a policy by uh, President Biden, assuming he enters the White House, uh, is by referring to the track record. I don't know any better way of assessing the future 
than relying on past uh, performance, which is the least subjective way of assessing the future. The past performance by uh, Biden when he was a vice president of Obama, in fact, uh, before that, when he was a senator, and certainly the track record of all the top uh, advisors to uh, Biden who are rumored to become national security advisor, secretary of state, or defense uh, secretary. Most uh, importantly, I believe, uh, Anthony or Tony Blinken, who was with Biden in the Senate and was with him uh, when Biden was vice president of uh, Obama. Uh, when we observe that track record, Certainly, we're talking about returning to the Obama-Biden uh, days, maybe with very, very small, insignificant nuances, but certainly we're going to see a departure from a pressure on uh, Israel, on uh, Iran, I'm sorry, pressure on Iran militarily and financial uh, by the current Dr Trump administration a shift to embracing uh, uh, the Ayatollahs. Will it be accompanied by additional $150 billion as they were uh, uh, courted or as they benefited from uh, Obama Biden? I don't know if it will <coughs> reach that level, but certainly it's going to be a rapprochement with the Ayatollahs of Iran. Rapprochement with the Ayatollahs of Iran means certainly tailwind to the Ayatollahs' fundamental uh, vision, fundamental uh, policy, which is not limited to developing nuclear uh, capabilities. It is primarily, primarily focused on terrorism and subversion and missile technologies. Uh, conventional and non-conventional warfare capabilities in order to topple every single regime in the Persian Gulf, every single pro-US regime throughout the Middle East to expand into Central Asia, into Africa, and to enhance their already, already very significant military terroristic uh, presence in South and Central America. The Ayatollahs operate, have operated for years with Hezbollah and with Hamas help in South America in the triangle between uh, Paraguay, Argentina, and Brazil, in the triangle between uh, Chile and Bolivia and uh, Peru. And they are not there in order to uh, take over uh, Central and, uh, and uh, South America. They are there as a springboard to cause havoc in the U.S. mainland where they already have very substantial number of sleeper cells awaiting, awaiting for a green light from uh, Tehran. Uh, certainly, uh, we're talking about a very uh, substantial uh, change of attitude towards the Muslim Brotherhood. The Obama-Biden administration embraced, courted the Muslim Brotherhood of uh, Egypt. Obama visited Egypt in 2009, shortly after him entering uh, the White House, and uh, he preconditioned his uh, visit to Cairo, his speech in Cairo, upon the presence of Muslim Brotherhood leaders. And that was during the days of the Mubarak regime, who considered the Muslim Brotherhood as they really are, a Muslim terrorist organization. Obama elevated them, which provided tailwind to the uh, victory of uh, the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt when they replaced uh, the Mubarak regime and they ruled Egypt for almost uh, two years. And those two years, they enjoyed 
the support, the friendship of, uh, of Obama, uh, who was pretty cold towards General Sisi, who, thank God, uh, removed the Muslim Brotherhood from power in Egypt. But that was also the attitude during the Obama-Biden regime towards the Muslim Brotherhood operations throughout the Middle East against every single pro-American, moder relatively moderate Arab regime, be it Jordan, be it Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, or uh, Bahrain. That is going to change in my uh, mind. We're not going to see uh, alliance between the US administration of Biden, if Biden enters the White House and uh, uh, and the Arab regimes who are fighting the Muslim Brotherhood, we're going to see alliance between the Biden administration and the, in fact, anti-American uh, Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, that also tells us a lot about uh, expectation in the battle against the overall phenomena of Islamic terrorism. Islamic terrorism was severely underrated uh, by the Obama-Biden administration. In fact, Obama-Biden prohibited every single uh, uh, national security counterterrorism intelligence agency in the US. They prohibited them from resorting to the term Islamic terrorism. Islamic terrorism did not exist as far as the Obama-Biden uh, administration. It was, as I said, heavily underestimated. And when the uh, Islamic Terror Act took place in Fort Hood, Texas in November of 2009, murdering 13 American soldiers, uh, many of us still remember the reference by the Obama-Biden administration to that act of terror workplace violence, namely all sorts of acrobatics in order to avoid naming uh, Islamic terrorism as it deserves to be named a major threat to the free uh, world and to America's allies in the, uh, in the Middle East. Certainly, there will be a change of attitudes towards uh, pro-American Arab countries, also in the sense of focus on human rights. Uh, Anthony Blinken, I mentioned his name as in my mind, the lead uh, candidate to become Secretary of State, if not Secretary of State, definitely National Security uh, Advisor, but certainly he's going to be the George Bush of, uh, I'm sorry, the Jim Baker of, uh, of uh, Joe Biden, namely that uh, uh, architect, Jim Baker of George Bush Sr.'s policy uh, will be uh, replaced now, uh, will be, would be replaced by uh, Tony Blinken uh, serving or shaping uh, Joe Biden's uh, policy. And Tony Blinken said recently, uh, the Saudis should realize that we are going to press them very, very seriously on human rights. Well, sadly, apparently, Tony Blinken is not exactly in touch with Middle East reality or the choice for the US or any other uh, Western country or Western democracy is not between pro-human rights and anti-human rights uh, uh, allies, but between allies of the US or allies of the Ayatollahs uh, in the Middle East, respect towards human uh, rights is limited today to one uh, country. Democracy is limited today to one country, and that's the Jewish uh, state. And the focus on human rights, the focus on democracy was one of the very critical errors by uh, President um, uh, George Bush uh, uh, Jr., uh, who after uh, the, uh, toppling Saddam's regime in Iraq, 
uh, announced his intention to introduce democr democracy into Saudi Arabia, which turned the Saudis into very, very cold uh, ally rather than a warm ally of the USA. A focus by the by a Biden administration on Saudi human rights is going to uh, be perceived by the Saudis as an additional stab in the back, additional to the one of supporting the Ayatollahs. A US regime which supports the Ayatollahs stabs the back of the UAE, of Bahrain, of Saudi Arabia, of Oman, of Jordan, of uh, Egypt, and provides tailwind to all rogue regimes, terror regimes in the uh, Middle East. And then certainly we have the issue of, the, uh, of Israel and the uh, Palestinian uh, element. Uh, again, I, re I revert back to Tony Blinken. Uh, Tony Blinken said on a number, a large number of occasions in uh, recent months when he wrote uh, articles, when he briefed uh, different audiences, uh, he, his focus was again returning to the so-called centrality of the Palestinian issue, ignoring, ignoring Middle East reality, ignoring the lesson of not only the recent peace treaties between Israel, UAE, Israel, Bahrain, Israel, uh, Sudan, which uh, were established notwithstanding <clears throat> opposition and pressure and threats and complaints by the Palestinians. But even if we go back to Israel, Egypt, Israel, Jordan, none of them centered around the Palestinian issue. The fact of life in the Middle East is if you want to advance the cause of Arab-Israeli peace and expand the circle of Arab governments joining peace with Israel, you have to distance yourself from the Palestinian issue. And not because uh, Israel uh, wants you to distance yourself, because that's the reality of the Middle East. Contrary to the Tony Blinkens of the Middle East, uh, the Susan Rice's of the Middle East, or what I call the Palestinian firsters, Palestine firsters in the Middle East, the Palestinian issue has never been a crux of the Arab-Israeli conflict, core cause of Middle East turbulence, or crown jewel of Arab policymakers. In fact, the pro-US, the relatively moderate Arab countries, do not want, they do not want a Palestinian uh, state. And the reason they don't want a Palestinian state is not only because the Palestinian state is not a primary or secondary or tertiary issue in Middle East uh, politics. It has never uh, triggered any major turbulence in the Middle East, but in addition to that, the Arabs have very long memory. They don't forget and then don't forget, forgive, unlike, unlike many Western policy uh, makers. And what don't they forget about uh, the Palestinians? They don't forget the Palestinians' involvement in counter-government terrorism in Egypt during the early 1950s, which force them to run away. Arafat, Mahmoud Abbas, and the rest of them running away from Egypt in 1955 due to their involvement in Muslim Brotherhood terrorism against the Egyptian government. They were given refuge in Syria, but by 1966, they had to run away from Syria because of their involvement in terrorism against the Syrian government, the Syrian intelligence uh, services. They were given refuge in Jordan, but by 1970, they couldn't control their urge. They tried to topple the Hashemite regime. They triggered the a civil war in Jordan, what we refer to as Black September, which forced the late King Hussein to 
uh, uh, devastate the PLO in Jordan and uh, expel some 10, 20,000 uh, PLO activists from Jordan to Lebanon. Uh, by 75, they plundered southern Lebanon and then they tried to take over uh, the regime, the, the control of the central regime in Beirut, which triggered a series of civil wars until 82, when they were expelled from Beirut by uh, an Israeli military operation. And the latest uh, milestone in PLO terrorism subversion against fellow Arabs took place uh, when they joined the Iraqi Saddam Hussein's invasion of uh, Kuwait, Kuwait, which was the most hospitable uh, host uh, of the Palestinians throughout the years, absorbing some 400,000 uh, Palestinians. And it was that Kuwait which the Palestinians stabbed in the back, joining the Saddam Hussein invasion of Kuwait, providing Saddam Hussein with, uh, uh, with intelligence uh, before the invasion and uh, rejoicing later on Saddam Hussein bombing uh, Riyadh with his uh, missiles. The Arabs do not forget and the Arabs do not forgive. And unlike many, many uh, Westerners, the Palestine firsters, they realize that a proposed, a proposed Palestinian state would add fuel to the Middle East uh, fire, not water to that uh, fire. Uh, will uh, Joe Biden and his advisors learn from past mistakes? I doubt it very uh, much, again, based on their own uh, track record. And my expectation is that once again, they will attempt to pressure Israel on the Palestinian issue. Uh, I see the clock is already uh, uh, ticking uh, the last uh, few uh, minutes. So I will uh, complete with that uh, issue of pressuring uh, Israel. Uh, pressuring Israel should not, should not shock any Israeli. As I mentioned before, we benefited from very exceptional four years. President Trump, unlike all presidents, Truman through Obama, Trump did not pressure Israel. Trump only expanded and expanded and expanded cooperation with Israel. We may very well, in my mind, we may very well go back to the ordinary relations between American presidents and Israel, namely periods of friction, periods of tension, possibly some punishment of Israel as uh, uh, was the case before uh, the presidency of Trump. But the fact is, the fact is that throughout those years from Ben-Gurion, who was severely, brutally pressured by Truman during the War of Independence, after the War of Independence, all the way through uh, Obama uh, 2016, throughout those years, simultaneously with pressure and friction uh, between the two administrations, we have ex we experienced dramatic, dramatic enhancement of cooperation between the two countries. And that expansion was a result of uh, very few distinct uh, reasons. First of all, the reality of the Middle East, which presented the US with a very, very easy choice. Israel, the only democratic, the only reliable, the only effective ally versus Arabs who at best are not reliable, at worst allies of the Soviet bloc, allies of Islamic terrorism, and usually, but for short period, anti-American uh, elements. Then there is the issue of the Israeli performance. Uh, President Obama uh, did not enter the White House as did President Trump 
with the conviction of enhancing US-Israel relations. President Obama at best was pretty cold on US-Israel ties. But once he started receiving the reports by the heads of the armed forces, by the directors of the intelligence uh, agencies, he realized that Israel constitutes a very, very unique force multiplier for the US. Indeed, he realized that Israel provides the US many times more than the, what is erroneously called foreign aid to uh, Israel. And President Obama, just like those who preceded him, decided not to cut his nose in defiance or in spite of his own uh, face. And sometime reluctantly, he expanded ties with Israel, usually, usually through the initiative by the national security uh, uh, forces, as well as the House and the Senate in, uh, in Washington. And then there is a third element, which I referred to briefly in the beginning of this uh, presentation, uh, the early pilgrims and the founding uh, fathers and the foundation of high appreciation towards uh, the Bible in general, and Moses' legacy in particular. Uh, this is not as strong today, not as nearly strong today as it used to be, but it's still very much part of the American reality for most Americans, although that majority uh, is reduced probably by the day. Uh, you enter today the US Supreme Court and you will see six, seven statues and inscriptions of Moses and the Ten Commandments. You enter the chamber of the House of Representatives and confronting the seat of the uh, Speaker of the House, uh, you have the bust of the head of uh, Moses. And throughout the US, there are well over 200 uh, uh, monuments of the Ten uh, Commandments, some of them in very, very prominent uh, sites, ground of state capitals, uh, municipal uh, headquarters, uh, state headquarters, uh, etc. And I mention all that because it's going to be pretty easy to resort to pessimism, maybe even fatalism, should Biden enter the uh, White House and implement uh, the traditional Biden, uh, Tony Blinken, Susan Rice uh, policy towards the Middle East in general, towards Israel in particular. There is absolutely no room for pessimism, no room for <coughs> fatalism. Again, for a simple reason, reality in the Middle East is much, much stronger than misconstrued misperceptions among about the Middle East, much stronger than the very, very unrealistic view of the Palestine uh, firsters in the Middle East. The capabilities of Israel are increasingly important for the US, especially in the last few years. And I believe this will continue in the next uh, at least few years when the US is determined to reduce its military presence in the Persian Gulf, in the Mediterranean, throughout the Middle East. For the US to reduce its military presence while the US still have very, very vital interest in the Middle East, they must have an entity which would fill their uh, place in the Middle East. And there is only one element in the Middle East which extends the strategic arm of the US without the need for a single American soldier, and that is the Jewish state. And I firmly believe that common sense realism shall prevail uh, uh, during the next four years as it did prevail during the years from Truman through the end of Obama when there was pressure, but at the same time, 
enhancement of uh, ties between the two uh, countries. I would like to conclude here and turn now to your own uh, comments, uh, not only questions, but if you have some criticism of uh, whatever I said, or if you have a different opinion, I would uh, welcome it. Thank you so much, uh, Joram. You know why we love you so much. Uh, most people uh, listening to the news uh, might have summarized that the situation is that we are all as we say in Yiddish, that we are all in deep trouble. But after listening to you, you are always so optimistic and always uh, realistic and telling us that basically you are telling us that as long as Israel knows what it wants and it stands firm, then we can, uh, as we say, we passed Pharaoh, we passed Obama, we will also pass Biden, if I could summarize what you say. You don't know how many questions people send us here for another four hours of lectures. I don't know what to choose. Um, I will just choose two to start with, uh, and then we'll open the chat to others who want to say something. Um, do you see Biden continuing the thrust of the Abrahamic Accords? That's number one. Number two, um, to what extent does Israel's dependence on American support limit its freedom of action and how can it break free of this dependence? Uh, there's many more There's many more questions, but okay. uh, I don't think we'll get to everything. And uh, I think that you're willing to maybe, if you agree, to give out your email and people can continue to be in touch with you after this discussion, because we will finish at eight in, a, in 10 minutes. Uh, if you agree, then give out your, your email and people can continue discussing things with you privately. Okay, when it comes to uh, expanding the circle of uh, peace treaties, uh, there's no doubt in my mind that uh, there are a few more Arab and African uh, Muslim countries uh, which are interested to join the cr uh, crowd of peace, so to speak, but they hesitate. They hesitate because they don't know uh, what's going to be the US uh, attitude towards Iran, uh, towards peace treaty with Israel, uh, if uh, there will be a Biden presidency. There's no doubt in my mind, if uh, Trump uh, would enter the White House, we would have right away a rapid expansion uh, because President Trump has made it very, very clear. He supports uh, those who are threatened by the Ayatollahs. And uh, I'm convinced that the threat of the Ayatollahs uh, coupled with the threat of the Muslim Brotherhood uh, played the key role behind the UAE and Bahrain uh, peace treaties with, uh, with uh, Israel. But they also want to know that the US provides them with the defense umbrella, so to speak, with the defense uh, backing, which they're not very certain uh, should Biden enter the White House for a simple uh, reason uh, they remember. They remember the eight years of Obama Biden when Obama Biden courted the Ayatollahs, uh, which have uh, their machete, the Ayatollah machete, at the throat of every single relatively moderate Arab regime in the Persian Gulf and throughout the, the Middle East. When it comes uh, to the expansion of the peace treaties, it also has to do with Israel's standing in the US. Uh, the UAE and Bahrain and Sudan uh, joined the peace uh, uh, circle with uh, Israel uh, in order also to leverage the Israeli good standing among most Americans and most American legislators in order to receive more uh, cooperation uh, from the USA. The F-35 is only one uh, such example, but not the only uh, example. Uh, the Arabs in general, and let's face it, uh, most of the world believe 
that uh, Israel uh, does enjoy a pretty solid stature uh, among Americans in general and on Capitol Hill in particular. And the more, the stronger the American stature in the, the Israeli stature in the US, the closer uh, will the Arabs be to uh, concluding peace treaty with uh, Israel. And when it comes to the other question of uh, will Israel be able uh, to follow its own interest to do certain things uh, without uh, American approval, if I understood the question uh, properly, uh, that's a, a very uh, sad reality of recent uh, years, which is different, very different from the years between 1948 and 1992, from Ben-Gurion through the end of the Shamir uh, prime ministership in 1992, all Israeli prime ministers certainly uh, vied, aspired for improved ties with the US, but not at the expense, not at the expense of Israel's independence of national security action. There were exceptions. Obviously, there were exceptions. Ben Gurion retreated from the whole of uh, Sinai due to Eisenhower's uh, pressure and Eisenhower's uh, promises and guarantees, which were proven to be uh, hollow, uh, totally uh, unrealistic. But generally speaking, uh, Israeli prime ministers uh, exhibited independence of action. They did not think, and rightly so, that there is a need for green light from Washington in order to advance Israeli interests, for instance, in Judea and Samaria, or in the Golan Heights, or in Jerusalem. And if we go back again very briefly, Ben Gurion declared independence not because he was allowed to but he served a message to Truman that was about two days before the Declaration of Independence that I, Ben-Gurion, am determined to declare independence. I'm going to welcome your support, but if you decide not to, uh, 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 not to support, it will be pretty sad, but I'm still going to declare independence. During the War of Independence, we saw uh, we witnessed very brutal pressure by Truman and the State Department and the CAA and the Pentagon for Israel to end so-called occupation of parts of the Negev and parts of the Galilee and parts of the coastal plain and Western Jerusalem. And they uh, threatened Ben-Gurion, but Ben-Gurion did not budge an inch. In fact, he expanded uh, the territory of Israel by 50% compared to the 1947 partition plan. You may call it, quote unquote, occupation by uh, Ben Gurion. The Western Galilee, part, large parts of the Negev, and obviously Western Jerusalem were not, were not supposed to be part of Israel. Jaffa was not supposed to be a part of Israel. Lida and Ramle. Uh, etc. Uh, Eshkol did not seek green light to reunite Jerusalem, did not seek green light to build the initial neighborhoods outside of Jerusalem and the initial settlements uh, in Judea and Samaria, Gush Etzion, uh, for instance. Uh, Golda Meir did not wait for green light uh, in order to expand settlements and expand construction in Jerusalem beyond the green line. In fact, all of them, the Gurion and Eshkol and uh, Golda did that while there was very, very uh, glaring red light coming out of Washington, which they ignored. They did not sacrifice the independence of Israel's national security action. Begin did not wait for green light to destroy Ozirak reactor in defiance of Reagan's brutal opposition and then very, very harsh punishment of Israel. Begin did not 
retreat from his decision to apply the Israeli law to the Golan Heights in spite of suspension of defense pact with the US, in spite notwithstanding suspension of uh, supply of uh, combat aircraft by the US, he still stuck to his decision and certainly Shamir did not budge to Bush and Baker pressure when it came to uh, expanding settlements in Judea and Samaria. In fact, those prime ministers who did not wait for green light and even acted in defiance of red light caused enhancement of respect towards Israel. They know how to distinguish between very, very uh, uh, tenuous popularity and long-term and deeply rooted respect. Until today, I hear when I visit Washington, which until the corona uh, pandemic three to five times a year, and every visit I used to hear uh, pronouncements of growing respect towards Shamir with whom those people never agreed, but they respected his principle uh, oriented policy, principle driven policy. Uh, when I hear yeah. that Israel cannot apply Israeli law to the Jordan Valley and parts or whole of Judea and Samaria or the whole of Area C, because supposedly nothing can be done effectively without green light from Washington, I wonder whether people really know Washington, and I wonder why have people forgotten about the track record of all prime ministers between Ben-Gurion and Shamir, which defies such an unrealistic statement, which may reflect uh, hesitancy, may reflect uh, weakness. Only a few days ago, I heard, and I was pretty offended by the news that supposedly, I haven't confirmed it, but supposedly uh, the Israeli government is asking the permission of the Trump administration to build in Jerusalem, in the aircraft uh, hill, Givata Matos. Uh, and supposedly Israel is asking for permission to expand the construction in few other settlements. That's a national degradation. It's a national humiliation, which in my mind does not enhance respect towards the current government from, uh, of Israel by its Washington colleagues, but rather undermines respect towards Israel. Thank you, Yoram. Uh, what I suggest now, dear friends, first of all, you got a lot of compliments on the chat. I don't know, you, you should read the chat afterwards. A lot of more mm -hmm. questions. But we have a special, uh, you are all special, of course, everybody, each and one of you. Um, there's, uh, we have from the United States with us, Denise Gary Pendel, who has a podcast. She's an educator. She's a broadcast of Middle Eastern radio. And she wants to say a few words in a second, Denise. I just want to summarize uh, and suggest the following. Number one, thank you, Yoram, for everything. Number two, thank you again to Renee and Shira and Yigal and Yehudit and I say thank you to all of you for being with us next week. Uh, at this time, we'll, at 7 p.m. in English, we will have Professor Arye Eldad. You will get details about it. What I suggest, if you agree, Yoram, is after we hear Denise, who wants to make a few comments, um, if you agree that we can go on with some questions uh, that if people, yeah. if, if people, if you agree to stay on and sure. people will just ask their own questions as sure. long as you want. Yigal, I'm asking Yigal, Yigal. Okay, mm -hmm. so I would like to say thank you to everyone. Anybody who feels that they have to go, this is the hour we promise to close. But because it's so fascinating and you are so great, Yoram, there's so many people who want to talk to you. Denise, say what you wanted to say, and then people just take the microphone and ask Yoram one by one your questions. Denise. I want to thank you, sir, so very much for your presentation today. And I really am grateful as an American because Israel is absolutely a force multiplier in terms of national security. But I'm deeply concerned 
about Black Lives Matter and Antifa. It's a growing movement here in the United States. I understand that Patricia Cullors and the leaders of the Black Lives Matter movement has, an, uh, has a meeting scheduled with President-elect Biden. Um, are you not deeply concerned about the demands that BLM and Antifa, who are really working in conjunction with the Palestinian terrorists, uh, they've worked with the communist government in China. Um, apparently, they have ties with other rogue regimes um, around the world. Are, are you not uh, more concerned about what they're going to do um, in terms of damaging U.S.-Israeli relations? I guess that's my first question. And I, I do want to thank you as well for the fact that you you were sensitive and careful about, you know, mentioning President or President-elect Biden. There are many of us here in the United States that really look forward um, to the massive voter fraud going forward in the courts here in the United States, and we're still very much hoping that the um, the President Trump will remain the President of the United States. Thank you, sir, and I'll I'll listen to your response. Oh, and I, if you don't mind, I take the uh, the uh, permission to ask one question that a few people asked. Should we should we use the next two months to do something about sovereignty? That is a question many people ask. If you can relate to that too. Okay, when it comes to uh, the Black Lives Matter and uh, Antifa, uh, obviously uh, we are aware of their very very radical, in my mind, anti-American, anti-Western. Uh, uh, culture cancel uh, uh, type of uh, uh, ideology. And I, I don't see any opening for a dialogue between them and uh, Israel or them and uh, pro-Israeli elements. My concern is with multitude of other organizations which are connected, connected to the Muslim Brotherhood and in the best tradition of the Muslim Brotherhood, they operate in the US as political offshoots of the Muslim Brotherhood. The Muslim yeah. Brotherhood, which goes back to 1928 when they're established in Egypt, has always, they have always uh, used both channels, the terroristic revolutionary channel side by side with the political channel. They do it today in every single Arab country. They do it, by the way, in India, in Bangladesh, in Pakistan, in many countries in Africa, and they do it in uh, the US uh, itself. And you have multitude of such organizations uh, which uh, have been active on American campuses, off American campuses, increasingly on Capitol Hill, which are front for the Muslim Brotherhood. They yeah. had open access to the White House during Obama Biden administration. They had absolutely no access during the uh, Trump Pence uh, administration. And certainly they are waiting for a change of uh, guard. I already heard both uh, Joe Biden as well as uh, Tony Blinken talking specifically about appointing American Muslims, American Arabs to top administration uh, position, which again goes back to the Obama Biden uh, days. Uh, that's not only troubling for uh, Israel, it's troubling for every single pro-American Arab country in the Middle East. In my mind, it should trouble every American because the agenda of those organizations is the agenda of the Muslim Brotherhood. And the agenda of the Muslim Brotherhood is very, very specified in the Muslim Brotherhood chronicles of history in their own writing. They do not believe in individual Arab regimes, they believe in a pan-Islamic uh, regime. They do not believe in 
Arab non-fundamentalist regimes. They firmly believe that Arab regimes, Muslim regimes, which do not adhere to the most fundamentalist nature of Islam are apostate regime and are doomed to be uh, toppled. And certainly when it comes to the US, when you follow the Muslim Brotherhood writings and operation, they firmly believe that the age of Western prominence is over. And this is now the age of Islam to research to global uh, prominence. And they don't uh, try to search to global prominence through enhance or advance science and technology and uh, education and democracy. They intend to search by deluding, by misleading the West into accommodating uh, them and uh, de definitely through subversion and through toppling of series of, uh, uh, of uh, regimes. Uh, I, in the process, I forgot uh, Nadia's uh, additional question. What was your uh, uh, additional question? I'm sorry. Sovereignty. Uh, is there uh, any sovereignty. way of okay. promoting sovereignty uh, the in the question, next two months? The question, the next two should, months. The, the, should there be any effort during the next two months? The, the real question should be, uh, what, why are those two months different than all prior months, than all future months? If you do not want to engage in uh, vital <laughs> national security activities during these two months, whether it has to do with annexation, whether it has to do with the Ayatollahs of Iran, whether it has to do with Hamas and Hezbollah, lest it offend the, an incoming president, why would you do it once the new president is inside the White House? Is it, does it make more sense to assert independence after the president, the new president is in the White House, then during those two months, there shouldn't be any difference. And by the way, when I saw Secretary Mike Pompeo in uh, Israel uh, declaring expanded pro-Israel policy by the State uh, Department, uh, I was not uh, shocked. I was not uh, surprised. In fact, he would have reneged on his duties if he would not have done uh, that. Uh, the US uh, should stick to its current policy towards the Ayatollahs, whether it is two months before vacating the White House, whether it's two months before starting a second term. Policy is policy, but more importantly, reality should drive policy, not opportunistic uh, timing. If you act only during opportunistic timing, you do that at the expense of your own vital uh, interests. And, and uh, last comment is the saddest of all. Uh, I, uh, I'm sad to assume that the main target for any additional effort is not in Washington, but sadly it is in Jerusalem where there should be an open ear, an open ear for uh, construction E1 connecting Malay Dumim to Jerusalem, where there should be an open ear to build in Givata Matos uh, uh, in, uh, in Jerusalem, where there should be an open ear to apply uh, Israeli law to Area C, where there should be open ear to uproot any Palestinian construction in Area C or in the Jordan Valley, et cetera. Sadly, sadly, uh, we have a government in Jerusalem which sometimes uh, acts as if it is a, a, a neutral uh, rather than Israeli government. Thank you. Any more questions, guys? We'll finish soon. I think we can all say thank you very much. Toda raba. Again, and, we're and, and by the way, Nadia, uh, because you mentioned that, anyone who would like to contact me, I'm much more active 
uh, via email than uh, Facebook or Twitter or LinkedIn. And my uh, email uh, is uh, Yoram Tex, uh, Y O R A M T E X, like Texas, Yoram Tex at and then gmail.com. And I would welcome uh, any comment, any question, better yet, any opinion, any suggestion on your part. And I promise to uh, respond. Uh, Nadia mentioned my website. I publish uh, weekly articles on US-Israel relations, on Middle East uh, at large, on the Jewish-Arab demographic uh, balance. And I would be very happy to share those articles with uh, any one of you who has not received them until today.